down at the bottom. So I'm, I'm happy to introduce Jeff. He is um, a biologist working for Audubon, Florida at the Florida Coastal Island Sanctuaries. And we are so lucky to have him be staff person there. And so he's gonna be talking to us today about his work there and, and one of his favorite birds in the world. So Jeff, thank you so much for coming to share your expertise with us. I am uh, very happy to be here. Let me, I'm, I'm trying to get my sharing all set up. Uh, yeah, we, we have a black screen at this point. There you go. Okay, is that, you can hear yep. me all right and, and see the, the slide just fine? Yep, can oh. see the slides. Oh. You might wanna talk a little bit louder. Okay, I can do that. Um, so I, like I said, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I, I spoke to Tampa Audubon Society. It, um, it's been a number of years now, maybe four years ago, um, when I was the, the rooftop nesting biologist uh, for Audubon, Florida in the area. Um, and I enjoyed that a lot. So I'm happy to, to speak to you again. Uh, you'll get a, a little taste of, of the rooftop um, nesting in this in this talk as um, oyster catchers have have followed the the least terns and a few other species and um, started to nest on on rooftops a little bit. So um, to get things started, um, I wanted to to show you. The, the range of the American oyster catchers. Um, they are um, present from all the way up in Maine down to Texas in, within the United States. Um, but the American oyster catcher continues all the way um, south to Argentina, as well as on the, the Pacific coast of Central America. Um, and the, um, interestingly, they are present on the Galapagos as well. It's a different subspecies, but um, it's, it's still the American oyster catcher there. In the, uh, on the Pacific, um, there's the black oyster catcher and, and then two other species in, uh, in the southern tip of South America. So um, to start off, identification of, of this bird is, is pretty straightforward. Um, they're a very bold, striking, um, unmistakable bird. Um, in this area, the only bird that you could possibly confuse them with is the black skimmer. Um, so the black skimmer is a, a seabird that um, is, is black on the top. It's uh, got much shorter legs and a distinctive um, black and orange beak with the, the underbite of the, the lower mandible being um, longer than the, the upper mandible. Um, and in this picture, you can see the, the characteristic orange bill here that's very strong. Um, I, I've heard it compared to a chisel um, for breaking into sh sh shellfish. Um, the juvenile, looks very similar. However, it has a, a dusky tip um, to that orange bill. Um, this dusky tip is very pronounced um, when they are first fledged and will last for about one to two years. Um, so this bird is a little bit older, still has some of that dusky tip, um, but they're otherwise identical to um, the adults. And so the, the chicks are semi-precocial, which means um, they, they aren't like, um, you know, songbird chicks, but they are up and running, um, you know, one, one day old, they're running around leaving the nest, um, but they don't feed themselves quite yet. Um, so they rely on their parents to bring them food. Um, so they'll make lots of trips back and forth to bring food to the chicks. 
and may also lead them to foraging areas. Um, oyster catcher parents are extremely dedicated parents. They will um, keep close guard over them. One, um, one of the mates will stay with the young chicks and the other will go off and forage um, and they'll work together that way. Uh, the smaller chicks will um, flatten and freeze um, if a predator approaches and they are very camouflaged um, in a variety of, of substrates. So um, the adults will give a, a call note saying there's danger in the area and um, good luck finding those um, chicks. But um, you're gonna know that it's a, an oyster catcher chick because the parents will be there and they'll be angry with you. Um, So um, I'm not sure what the catcher part is in their name, but the oyster part is, is a good one. Um, they eat primarily oysters and other bivalves, um, such as clams and mussels. Uh, they are also uh, opportunistic. So during red tide events, such as um, we had in, in Tampa Bay this fall, they will eat horseshoe crabs, um, as well as I've seen them eat dead fish. Um, so that's um, an unfortunate thing, uh, um, but something that I found interesting. Um, so they're, they're nesting, um, they, Unlike species like the black skimmer or other beach nesting birds, they are solitary nesters. Um, so one pair will nest by themselves. They um, make a little depression and will lay their eggs right there on the, on the sand or, or stone. Um, so this bird you can see right here has um, one egg. I don't know if you can make that out. The eggs are, are nice and camouflaged. And um, they'll lay usually three eggs. And if their first nests fail, they will um, relay up to um, three times. Um, but if they're successful, they will, um, they'll only nest once during a season. Um, and you can see this bird, um, it's, it's tending to the nest. Um, and what they're doing a lot of the time is just shading the, the eggs. Um, so they don't need to incubate to keep them warm a lot of the times here in, uh, in Florida. Um, so they're just shading them to keep them cool, actually. Um, so the, the nesting timeline usually begins in, in March um, for the birds here in Florida, and they'll spend about 28 days incubating. And then it takes about 35 to 40 days until those chicks are flight capable um, or fledged. Uh, during that time, the parents will be with them constantly and providing food for them. And then once they are flight capable, they may stick around the area where they were nesting or they may leave. Um, often they will stay with um, their parents for a number of um, weeks or months as they're, they're learning to find food and, and be independent on their own. The, the nesting habitat, um, this is sort of a, a typical spot. Um, this is a, an oyster catcher sitting on a nest. I know it's hard to, hard to make out the um, nest there, um, but they, they like areas that are you know, not too far above the high tide line that are on low exposed, sparsely vegetated beaches um, or spoil islands, even shell rakes in some areas. And um, in Tampa Bay, they have taken to nesting on rooftops too. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. So they are um, very adaptable and willing to nest in non-traditional habitats. You can see here's one nesting in um, some grass that's above a, uh, a riprap um, shoreline. And then here's another one um, on the right that's 
um, nesting on a gravel roof. Um, they're both sitting on, on their nests there. Um, so this is a bird that is, has been impacted by uh, human modifications to a, a large degree and is very much trying to work with us and uh, be flexible about where they're nesting. Um, they also um, will nest on um, airports. This is uh, the Albert Witted Airport in St. Pete, where a pair has been nesting for um, a number of years now. Um, and they would have been nesting somewhere off, um, you know, in, in the grass where it was a little bit sparser maybe. And um, then those, those little chicks hatched out and um, we were monitoring this site and saw them running across the tarmac there. Um, so a very, very interesting um, habitat that they will, will choose to nest in sometimes. And then their, their foraging habitat. Um, they will nest in a variety of, or they will um, forage in a variety of, of habitats from oyster beds to mud flats and, and beaches. So they're mostly finding food at low tide when um, their prey is exposed. And then during high tide, you'll, you'll oftentimes see them roosting at a site waiting for the tides to change when they can, can forage again. Um, so here on the left, this is an example. During, during high tide, these are birds um, that are, are roosting, waiting to um, go back out and forage once the, the tides change. Uh, so there's a, an interesting um, sort of way that these birds interact throughout the year. Um, so on the left, this is during the non-breeding season, they'll sometimes form large flocks over a hundred birds. Um, and they will uh, go out and forage together and fly to their, their roost sites together. Um, but then when breeding season comes, it's a, a totally different story. Each pair um, will fiercely defend their territory and their, their nest site. Um, so this is an example on the right here of two different pairs that are displaying and calling and um, trying to figure out exactly where the, the territory lines are. And um, but so they, they go from this half of the year being in these big groups to half of the year, you know, being very territorial and, and not willing to allow any other oyster catchers into their area. Uh, so the, in, in Florida, a lot of the oyster catchers are residents um, year round. They, they breed here and they might wander around a little bit during the non-breeding season, but for the most part, they, they stay here. Um, and in the winter, those, those numbers in, in this area are buoyed by oyster catchers that are migrating from, uh, further, from areas further north. Um, so, um, the whole Atlantic coast, a lot of those birds move south. Um, Cedar Key is a huge wintering location for a lot of migrants. Um, they've got outstanding oyster beds that um, the birds will, will fly from um, the Northeast and, and uh, spend the winters there. Uh, so here's a look at the statewide um, breeding distribution. So this is where they're nesting. Um, there are a few hot spots. Um, and one of those is the productive estuary um, of Tampa Bay. Um, so Hillsboro and Pinellas counties are, have, have quite a few oyster catchers nesting in them um, compared to the rest of uh, Southwest Florida. Um, and so as an adaptation to increasing pressure on ground nesting sites, um, you know, if you've, you've been to the beaches in, in Pinellas County, you, you can understand that. Uh, the oyster catchers have started nesting on, on gravel rooftops. So they, in the same way as they would on the sand, they would make a little depression and lay their eggs directly on the gravel. Um, this was first documented in, in the 80s. And in recent years, it's been um, between 10 to 15 pair um, that um, are nesting on rooftops in primarily in Pinellas, but also um, Hillsborough County. And they're 
primarily located um, very close to um, the water. So whether it's um, the bay or the gulf or the intracoastal um, buildings are, are very close to those big bodies of water. Um, and in recent years, there have been a few pair, one or two pair um, of oyster catchers that have started doing this in Virginia and New Jersey. Um, so, um, you know, that, that sort of indicates um, the pressures there as well of um, human disturbance um, of, of the beaches where they would, would have traditionally been nesting. Uh, so here's a, a few scenes of rooftop nesting oyster catchers. Um, we provide small wooden, wooden shelters for the chicks to be able to find shade and avoid predators um, like you see here. And oyster catchers can be quite productive on rooftops, you know, sometimes raising um, three chicks. They lay three eggs and, and raise three chicks. Uh, there are plenty of oysters and um, they, they seem to be able to do pretty well on, on the rooftops for the most part. Um, one of the, the downsides is that they will fall off the rooftop sometimes. Um, it's, it, it seems to be when um, a person goes on the roof or there's a, a predator um, that the, the young chicks will um, just run and run and um, find themselves um, falling off the beach um, and into a parking lot or something like that. Um, so that is an issue with um, some of the sites where, where they are nesting on rooftops. So this is a, a young oyster catcher chick that was rescued by um, residents at one of the buildings and I was able to return back up onto the rooftop to um, some very relieved parents that were, were up there uh, wondering where their chick had gone. So um, the big question is, are rooftops good nesting habitat? Is this something that we should be encouraging? Um, so I last year uh, published a, a paper in the Florida Field Naturalist that was, was trying to answer these questions. And um, so the pros of, of rooftop nesting, decreased human disturbance and mammalian predation um, compared to ground nesting sites and also no overwash. Um, that's a, a big issue at a lot of sites. They nest you know, low, close to the waterline and a storm surge or something like that can overwash their nest. Um, so rooftop nesting birds had really high uh, hatching success um, and their chick survival rates were quite similar to those on the ground. Um, the cons are, um, like I mentioned, the chicks can fall. Um, there's still avian predators such as fish crows that seem to be an issue with the rooftop nesters. And another con is that the urban environment is um, a pretty dangerous place to be learning to fly. Um, so this picture you can see there's um, a pair here that have um, a chick that has just left a rooftop and is um, still not very capable of, of flying and maneuvering very well. They can fly sort of in long horizontal distances, um, but turning and gaining altitude, um, they're not very good at that. So, um, you know, evolving to um, learn to fly on a beach um, and actually learning to fly in an urban environment, um, there, there, do, there does seem to be some loss um, associated with um, these urban nesting uh, American oyster catchers that the, the chicks just can't make that transition to learning to fly and uh, navigating all those obstacles. Uh, so the American oyster catcher is an imperiled species in Florida as it is in many states um, where it occurs. Um, it's estimated by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission that there are about 450 breeding adults in the state and uh, about 20% of those breed in the, the Tampa Bay area. Uh, and they have um, definitely declined in Tampa Bay in um, recent decades. And um, that same trend is, is uh, mirrored around the state. 
Um, so there are a number of different threats to the oyster catchers. The, the primary one is um, loss of habitat from development and disturbance on, on beaches. Um, so um, with laying your eggs right on the, on the sand and needing to sit there for four weeks and then needing five weeks to raise those chicks, um, you know, that's, that's something that is really difficult to get done on um, Florida beaches. Uh, so um, a lot of the habitat that would be suitable is um, rendered um, effectively gone because of all of the, the disturbance from humans on the beaches. And additionally, the, the human associated predators, you know, we have really high populations of fish crows um, because um, fish crows benefit from the human refuge, refuse and raccoons and coyotes as well um, take advantage of human waste and are also common predators of eggs and chicks. Um, sea level rise is um, only going to further limit um, the available habitat and the same for loss of, of gravel roofs. Um, they're being replaced with more efficient forms of, of roofing. Um, so that will take away another location where oyster catchers have, have nested. Conservation efforts are, are focused primarily on improving nesting outcomes um, because that's where a lot of the, the problems are. They aren't um, raising enough chicks to be able to um, replace those that are lost from the population each year. So limiting disturbance by um, posting sites and stewarding, you know, educating beachgoers and um, boaters um, is, is an important way to try and reduce that human pressure. And also restoring both nesting areas and foraging areas. So making sure there's a place where they can lay their eggs and have their chicks, as well as areas where they can find food um, that are in close proximity to those nesting areas. Um, predator management is also a part of this, um, you know, reducing trash for, for fish crows, removing perches that are, you know, right over where the, the birds are nesting, um, those sorts of things are, are also an important part of this. Um, so at this point, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk more broadly about um, the Florida coastal island sanctuaries and, and what we do. Um, so Florida coastal island sanctuaries is a, a part of Audubon, Florida. Um, and the, the mission is really to protect the colonial water birds um, in Florida and um, protect the habitats that, that they use. Um, the, so going, going back in history a little bit, the plume trade of um, the early 1900s and Audubon's beginnings in, um, in Tampa Bay are, are a, a fascinating story. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't have time to, to delve into that tonight. Um, Ann Paul has an incredible knowledge of this and would be more than happy to, to share it with you, I'm sure. Um, it's, it's a really interesting um, story with, with different characters. And um, um, so ask her about that if you're interested. But um, we'll, we'll sort of fast forward through that, knowing that there were these amazing numbers of, of birds present in the Tampa Bay area and um, across Florida. Um, and the plume trade really decimated those numbers. They've um, recovered to some extent, but aren't um, you know, back to those high levels that they were prior to um, uh, the 1900s and, and that the plume trade. So at Coastal Island Sanctuaries, we're trying to protect bird colonies. Um, well, let's start with talking about a bird colony. Um, so bird colonies are groups of nesting birds that come together. It can be multiple species nesting in a, in a close area or single species. Um, and that can be in trees um, like ibis, storks, um, herons, egrets, or on the ground like a lot of uh, terns, gulls, and skimmers do. 
Um, these colonies are usually on islands um, where mammalian predation is not an issue. So colonies are um, loud and, and stinky places and would be very obvious to predators. Um, so that's why they're almost always found on islands is um, they can take the time it takes to go through the, the nesting process, have their eggs and chicks safe from predators um, and be able to successfully reproduce. Um, so a, a little bit of information about where Coastal Island Sanctuaries works. Um, we work throughout uh, the, the greater Tampa Bay area um, from Pasco County down um, to Charlotte and inland to Polk County. A lot of our sites are coastal along the, the Gulf or intracoastal waterways. Um, also in Tampa Bay and inland. Um, there are a lot of inland sites around Hillsborough and, and Pasco County um, where we have a, a variety of different birds nesting, including um, wood storks. So it's a variety of habitats, including mangroves, um, cypress, and, and we also work with a lot of shorebirds um, during the non-breeding season, uh, monitoring um, them on, on mud flats. Um, so Hillsborough Bay is the uh, northeastern uh, portion of Tampa Bay. Um, so this is Tampa Bay, is Tampa up here in the north of Hillsborough Bay. And we have MacDill Air Force Base um, on the, the left-hand side of the map here. And in the middle of Hillsborough Bay, are a few islands that are why Hillsborough Bay is recognized as a globally important bird area. Um, so there are two large islands, um, 2D and 3D are dredge spoil islands that are out in the middle of, of the bay there. Um, they're active dredge spoil islands. So um, when the shipping channels need dredging, which they do frequently, um, all of that sediment that they dredge out gets um, piled into these, these big islands. Um, and the other island um, islands are also dredge spoil islands, and those are um, what we call the Alifaya Bank, which is comprised of Sunken Island and Bird Island here near, near um, Gibsonton. Um, in these areas, we have a wide variety of birds that use these different habitats, both for nesting um, and during the non-nesting season and foraging. Um, so what do we do at uh, the Florida Coastal Island Sanctuaries? Uh, one of the main things that we do is survey these colonies during the nesting season um, to determine the nesting abundance of each species. Uh, we try to monitor the productivity of, um, especially the species of, of high concern, um, reddish egrets, brown pelicans, roseate spoonbills, um, species like that that we're, we're really concerned about. Um, we try to monitor um, how many fledges um, they produce and how many um, from each nest. And we also keep an eye out for issues. Um, such as human disturbance, or if there's a predator that we think is on one of the islands. Um, so monitoring these islands throughout the, the breeding season is, is important. Uh, volunteers can help be our eyes and ears at, um, by joining what we call the Project Colony Watch. Uh, so by visiting these nesting colonies throughout the season, uh, volunteers can collect important data and it uh, allows us to better manage the sites for birds. Uh, we can monitor the number of species, see how they're doing, if they're um, able to produce chicks or if there's something's going on in the colony that needs addressing. Um, and through all this, this data, we can um, really monitor the changes in the population over time. So we can um, you know, see if certain species is declining over the years or um, we're holding steady and, and we can tailor our, our efforts towards that. 
Um, so if you're interested in, in helping with uh, Colony Watch, there are you know, sites that are accessible um, by, by car, you can, can drive to, don't have to take a boat to, um, talk to I, either myself or Ann Paul about um, getting involved in, in that. We'd be happy to uh, have your help. Um, another important thing that we do is posting sites um, to try to reduce human disturbance. Um, so most people um, don't mean to cause harm, although some do, most don't. Um, so, you know, they, but they don't know, um, you know, necessarily how their actions are impacting the birds. Um, so by providing signage, um, education and outreach, we can make sure that the birds have safe places to nest. Um, so that's uh, a part of what we do um, in Hillsborough Bay and at um, sites around uh, the Tampa Bay area. Um, another component to um, Coastal Island Sanctuary's work is dealing with the, the major issue um, that I'm sure you're aware of is um, bird entanglement in, in fishing lines. So it affects local birds, um, not just brown pelicans, although they are very commonly um, affected by this. Um, so there are some, uh, a few pictures in here of, of Ann Paul, if, um, if you didn't um, pick that out already. Um, this is one where, um, you know, a fishing line got into, um, probably at Egmont Key, um, got into um, a laughing gull colony and all these birds got tangled up. Um, this can happen either a, a pelican or another bird gets, gets hooked and the line gets cut, that bird flies back to the colony or roost site and then um, tangles in the mangroves and gets stuck. Um, or if, if an angler is um, accidentally snags their line on, on the mangroves and, and cuts the line, then that line is sitting there for, um, as a hazard to birds for, for many years. So um, in the fall, we organize an annual fishing line cleanup at important sites throughout the region and are also actively involved in um, the Hooked Pelican Working Group, um, which FWC um, put together recently um, to try to reduce the conflict between um, fishing line and, uh, and birds. And education and, and outreach are an important um, component to addressing this problem. And um, the, the wonderful video that um, you all produced and um, Anne talked about at the beginning of the meeting um, is, is a really important piece to that as well. So I, um, I'm really thrilled with that video and um, everyone who helped out with it. Um, so the annual um, fishing line cleanup that we do, uh, volunteers play a big role in this. There are a lot of different sites that we try to um, get out to. Um, and um, Tampa Audubon has, has been a part of that for a lot of years. Um, so another thing that, that we um, spend time working on is working with law enforcement agencies um, because many of the, the bird species that um, we work with are imperiled. Um, they are protected by law. Um, the issue is that many of the, the law enforcement officers, whether they work for FWC, a sheriff's office, um, or um, you know, different towns or municipalities, they don't necessarily know the laws or the biology of the birds to be able to enforce these protections or you know, help inform boaters um, or beachgoers how they can avoid um, harming the birds. So we work with different partners to put on workshops each year um, to provide that education to law enforcement officers so that when they are out there um, or get called to a site, um, they can help make sure that they know what's going on and what to look for and, and how to be able to help the birds. Um, so we have one of these planned for um, the first week of March and um, right before nesting season kicks into full swing. 
Um, so a lot of these sites um, were also plagued by invasive species. Um, so Brazilian pepper and lead tree are two really common species that we have at a lot of these islands. Um, so we've been um, trying to restore these islands um, and that, that involves cutting and treating the invasive species with herbicide. And then um, oftentimes we'll, we'll have to um, go in and plant native species. Um, so we make sure that we're planting species that the birds um, will use for nesting. Uh, Florida privet is, is a good one. Um, buttonwood is another one. And we also um, use species like sea grape and cabbage palm at these sites that are good hardy plants um, that are native species and will benefit not just uh, the nesting birds, but um, the whole ecosystem. Um, so these two spoil islands that, that I mentioned um, when we were looking at the map, um, they're named 2D and 3D. Um, so they're both active spoil islands. And because there's um, a continual supply of fresh sand, um, from the dredging process, they host thousands of gulls, um, laughing gulls, and different species of terns, skimmers, and oyster catchers each year. Um, so the, these islands are actively um, receiving the dredge material, sometimes in the nesting season. Um, we work with the Army Corps of Engineers and Port Tampa Bay and their contractors. Um, and we ensure that the birds aren't harmed, you know, through this, this dredging and, and disposal and coordinate to make sure that they have a place to nest and, and aren't being impacted by, by those activities. Uh, so around the, the outside of those, those islands, oyster catchers will, will nest along the shoreline and where a few, um, decades ago, there would have been 50 pair on those two islands. Um, that has dwindled down to um, 12 pair is what we had last year. Um, and this is largely due to poor productivity and habitat loss. Um, so it's hard to make out, but in this picture, there's an oyster catcher at the bottom of this um, erosion um, escarpment here that's sitting on eggs. Um, so it's not a very good place to nest. It's um, low elevation that um, is going to get washed over more than likely. And when erosion like this starts on these islands, um, the Army Corps or the um, Port of Tampa Bay who manage the islands um, will um, come in and what they've been doing is come in and put rock riprap over the, the erosion to protect the shoreline and stop that erosion. And that effectively eliminates the habitat for nesting of, of oyster catchers. Um, so that's, that's something that we're working with um, uh, those partners on coming up with better ways to protect the shoreline that they need to do, and, as well as uh, improve the habitat for, for nesting oyster catchers. Um, that we're, we're hoping to reverse this trend of, of decreasing numbers in, in the bay. Um, so the other um, really important nesting site in Hillsborough Bay is the Richard T. Paul Alifaya Bank Bird Sanctuary. Um, it's leased from and managed in collaboration with the Mosaic Company and Port Tampa Bay. Um, it's a critical wildlife area. Uh, so it is um, off limits to humans year round it's closed and there is a, a buffer around the entire uh, perimeter of, of the islands. So up to 18 um, species of water birds will nest here, um, including spoonbills, reddish egrets, brown pelicans, American oyster catchers, um, and it can be over 10,000 pairs at times. About 20% of Florida's spoonbills um, nest on the island here, um, as well as all of the threatened herons and egrets um, that are listed by um, FWC. And uh, 
the bulk of the, the um, breeding pairs is made up of brown pelicans and white ibis. So it's an important place for, for those species as well. Um, unfortunately, the, the islands have been experiencing heavy erosion due to ships wakes um, from, uh, from the nearby channels, as well as storms. Um, so here's an example of how the island's sediments have um, been washed away by, um, by, that, by the, the wakes and the, and the waves from storms. Uh, we've got uh, mature mangroves were, were out there were being toppled and valuable nesting habitat um, was being destroyed. Uh, so over, over the, the past um, 10 years or so, uh, living shorelines have been deployed around the, the islands at the Alifaya Bank. Um, so the, the picture on the right here is these concrete units that are placed offshore. And um, this is a picture on the bottom here of those same units that are then covered in oyster catcher, in not in oyster catchers, in oysters. The, the oyster catchers do love them now. Uh, so these units, um, these breakwaters, help to disseminate the waves, reduce that um, force that's um, actually arriving at the, the shoreline um, so that all that wave energy isn't just um, eroding the, the shoreline. Um, we have increased uh, mangrove and, and other plants um, recolonization of that area and regrowth behind those. And um, the cement structures being quickly colonized by oysters um, provides additional benefits to um, both wildlife and um, water quality. Um, so it's a, a great way to um, solve the issues that um, have been plaguing the, the Alifaya Bank. So these are at a smaller scale and a more recent project on the, sorry about that, on the north of the island um, were these larger scale um, concrete uh, breakwaters that were put in. So this is an aerial view on the left and you can see that they're placed offshore. Um, that way, the, the natural water um, land interface is still present um, for mangroves, mangroves to grow, birds to use. Uh, and these offshore breakwaters um, will stop the wave energy or reduce it enough that that erosion is, is significantly reduced. In this, this picture during construction, you can see even a, a slight chop in the water outside of the breakwaters, behind it is uh, a calm water. Um, so this is the, what the um, islands look like now. Um, this is an aerial image from, um, taken from a plane flying over the, the area, and you can see this all along um, the, the shoreline are these um, living shorelines, these breakwaters. Um, it's about a, a mile of, of breakwaters now, and um, this will help prolong the lifespan of these islands, make sure that this valuable nesting habitat is, is still um, present for, for many years for these, these birds. In addition to the Alifaya breakwater, which was completed um, at the end of 2019, um, we have projects in the works at four other important nesting sites in the region. Um, three in um, Western Pinellas in the Intracoastal, as well as um, Dot Dash Dit Critical Wildlife Area um, that's um, up, that's in Manatee County um, at Palmetto. Um, so these projects will help save these islands that are used by um, reddish egrets, wood storks, uh, brown pelicans, and, and roseate spoonbills, among other species. Um, so we're really excited about getting these projects um, 
built uh, so that we can conserve these islands as well. Um, and with that, uh, I, I want to say thanks for listening. I, I hope you learned something new and I didn't put you to sleep. And I'm happy to take um, any questions that you might have at this point. Great, thank you, Jeff. I'll, I'll jump in here because several questions have come in and I've been monitoring the chat. Um, so the first questions, what, and I'll, these came in from one person, so I'll just read them as a group. What can be done to keep chicks from going off the roof, any type of barricade, and what can be done to enhance and protect nesting pairs on the shoreline? So I think you might have covered some of that, but anything else you would like to add? Um, sure. Yeah, those are those are great questions. Um, so the with the oyster catchers chicks falling off the roof, um, that's a problem for the least turns as well. Um, so what we've done with the least turns and have started implementing with the, the oyster catchers as well is um, putting up um, some fencing around the perimeter of um, the 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 roof edge. Um, so just using hardware cloth to create little, um, um, basically a, a barricade, um, like you were, you were asking, that um, the birds will still nest there. They don't mind it being there. And it helps prevent the chicks from, from falling off. Um, and as far as what can be done to enhance and protect nesting pairs on the shoreline, um, so it's, it's a, a, a difficult question to, or it's a good question, difficult um, answer. Um, so regrading the, the shoreline in some areas would, would definitely help if you have a more, where you have that erosion, if you have a gentler slope, um, then um, that's better for the oyster catchers to be able to find something that isn't vegetated too much, where they, they don't like putting their eggs. Um, but also is high enough above the tide line to where um, they don't overwash from, um, you know, a high tide or, uh, you know, minor storm event. Um, so that's, that's definitely something. And um, putting in some of these um, offshore breakwaters would be a great way to uh, both reduce that erosion on um, and also provide uh, good foraging habitat for, for the oyster catchers. So that's something that I think more of would be, would be helpful. All right, there are, there are uh, some more questions here, but just on that note, um, it occurred to me down on, on the Alofaya banks, do those breakwaters along that north edge, are they helping at all with keeping the photographers and the, the boaters away? Does that help? Because I, I know that's a problem. Yeah. Um, so that wasn't, that always is a problem. You know, it is a, um, it is a critical wildlife area. So technically no one is supposed to be going in there, but um, that doesn't always deter everyone. Um, the breakwaters weren't designed to keep people out, but um, it does seem like it's it's having um, a positive effect in in that way. Um, additionally, just um, sort of acting as a as a barricade to to keeping people from entering on the on the North Shore, especially. I think. Okay. Um, another question that came in: Would it be helpful through voluntary actions or design choices to introduce back small patches of stone roof to more buildings? and or place more place small sheltering structures to allow for shelter from sunlight and birds of prey. So again, I think you covered some of that, but. Yeah, um, so that's something that um, we're talking with partners about and, and trying. Um, it's a something that um, we've discussed and they, oyster catchers will nest on relatively small rooftops. Um, you know, a, a single family home or, or smaller. Um, so it wouldn't have to be a, a, a huge 
area that you'd provide for them if it's in the right spot. Um, I think it could be beneficial and I think it would be um, potentially used by the, the oyster catchers. And yeah, as, as a part of that, um, definitely putting out shelters to um, provide those chicks a place to get away from uh, the sun and uh, crows and, and hawks. How much, um, how much rooftop nesting is happening here in Hillsborough County? Any at all that's known now? Um, there are, I think there were two um, pairs, so two different rooftops um, on the, in Old Tampa Bay last year. Um, so pretty close to the, um, the bay there, there are a few buildings where they've been nesting, but it's the majority of it is, um, is over in Pinellas. Okay. Um, I, there is another question here uh, about spoonbills, but let me ask first um, about, still about oyster catchers. So in the fall, um, we do have the Northern birds coming down. I mean, I, I found, uh, saw two banded birds up in Cedar Key. And when I reported them, they told me that one had been banded in Long Island and one had been banded in North Carolina, I think. So they come here. Do our nesting birds go further south into the Caribbean and then come back or do they just stay here through the winter? Yeah, um, so that's a, a, a good question and it banding is is the way we is how we know these things. Um, so it's an important part of the um, conservation and understanding what these birds are doing. Um, so through banding, um, we know that, yeah, a lot of those northern birds, um, they'll come down here to spend the winter or even pass through here and go to Nicaragua, um, for example. Um, but um, the birds that, that breed here, uh, by and large, will, will stick around here. Um, so they, they may move around a little bit to um, different areas than where they nest. But um, yeah, they, they definitely seem to be staying locally um, year round. Okay. So we can't blame the dro dropping numbers on hunting in the islands or something like that. No, nope. our own our, fault. Nope, yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, another question that came in, how does spoonbill nesting compare to prior years? Um, that's a good question. The um, spoonbill numbers had, had been um, pretty steady over, um, over a, maybe a five year span or so and have dipped a little bit um, in the last uh, maybe two to three years. Um, so it's, um, it had been, over 200 pairs and now it's um, just under 200 pairs. And um, it, it seems to be more a matter of um, them. So the, the spoonbills have been increasing in inland areas and moving further north. Um, so they, um, there's a place in, in Polk County where um, they're nesting now and uh, it, it isn't necessarily that they are, you know, it's a loss in, in spoonbills, but maybe a, a shifting in, in where they're nesting. Okay. What's, um, you had, you mentioned something about 20% of the oyster catchers in the state nest in this area. Do you have any idea what percentage of the Florida spoonbills nest in this area? Um, so it's, it's also about 20%. Um, so the, um, we don't have as accurate of um, estimates for the statewide uh, spoonbill numbers, um, but um, yeah, it, it, it's roughly 20% um, that would, would be nesting um, in Tampa Bay. Okay. Um, let's see, there's some thank you very much, excellent, some amazing conservation effort, efforts, the identification trip tips really help. Um, and that seems to be everything that was in the chat. So if anybody else has a question, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask or 
put it in the chat box and I'll pass it on. Yeah, I just wondered, um, this is probably a stupid question, but you know, once once there's all that erosion and um, the Army Corps reinforces the eroding sides of the island with riprap, I mean, is there any, I just wonder about putting sand on top of that, that you kind of have stabilized the, the, the ocean front, you know, that maybe the oyster catchers would nest on top of that. You know, Anne's probably going to pull her hair out, but I, it's just something I, I was, uh, that yeah. just, I thought if it's, if it's stabilized and they put sand on top of it, maybe that would be a good place. Yeah, not at all a, a stupid question or a stupid idea. Um, it's, it's something that, that I've wondered and um, I have seen oyster catchers um, nest sort of at a, on a elevated area. Um, that would be a similar thing like out at Egmont Key, they'll nest on top of the battery. Like I've seen them up probably 25 or, or 30 feet above high tide line, you know, on this, this steep sort of slope. Um, so if they aren't opposed to it and, you know, nesting on rooftops, they can, they can adapt. Um, it would, so the issue there might be um, that so once those chicks hatch out and they start running around, um, they might um, end up running and um, falling into that riprap and not being able to climb back out. Um, so that's, that's something that um, would be a concern, but I do think that there, there might be the, the possibility of creating areas where um, they could nest up high, where they're safe from the shipwakes and overwash um, and hopefully be able to um, lead their chicks then to, to the shoreline safely. So I think it's something worth exploring for sure. Well, I wondered too, like at Fort DeSoto, they had the raft for the lease turns, you know, the, and, and I just wondered if something like that could be created for the, for the oyster catchers there. Would they nest on something like that if it was connected to the shore? It's, that's a good question. I'm not aware of any any raft I just, I just or wonder. oyster catchers, but um, I don't see why they wouldn't. They're they're extremely flexible. I I can offer an opinion on that if you will let me. Please. So um, the the project at Fort DeSoto was you know took a lot of effort from volunteers and never succeeded at all really in any way. Um, and oyster catchers are gonna wanna nest on the shoreline next to the water, um, pretty much. They, we did over the time, we have had a couple of pairs of oyster catchers nest on the inside of 2D or 3D when there's been water in there. And again, they're nesting right at the shoreline. Um, so, uh, during the nesting season, if there's any increase in the water level due to the dredging work that goes on, they would be at risk for that. Um, so you have to look at what are the oyster catchers comfortable doing, and um, they generally want to nest at the water line, um, just above the high tide line, and they generally don't like to nest on the top of the berm in any respect. Um, we did have a couple of pairs nest above riprap at one point on the south west corner of 3D when the first riprap went in because they had been nesting down on the shoreline and when the riprap gets put next to the island, the water just removes all the sand in front of the big rocks. Um, the waves just move the sand away from the big rocks. And then you just have the sheer riprap going into the water. So uh, those oyster catchers that nested above where they would have nested on the beach that year, um, laid eggs, lost their young, laid eggs, lost their young. And finally, they didn't, they stopped doing, stopped nesting there at all. It, you just have to go with what these obligate beach nesters will accept and what they won't accept. 
can't make them do what they won't want to do. Doggone it. <laughs> okay, and I'll, I'll turn it back to you because there's no other questions here. Jeff, thank you very much. There's a few more. Thank you for the work you do. Comments Zinni coming in, but that's it. Does anybody have any other questions for Jeff while we have him here? He's got a lot to tell us. Oh, good. Erwin, you're muted. Erwin, you're still muted. Okay. I want to report that I saw a couple of hundred oyster catchers up around Bayport, west of uh, Spring Hill, a couple of weeks ago. Huge flock. Wow. That's, yeah. I This, this time of year, they um, will flock up like that, and it's probably birds from all up and down the, the Atlantic. Um, that have, have gathered there. That's, um, I didn't know that that area was, um, would be so good for oyster catchers, but that's great. Yeah, it was an impressive sight. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I've also seen on eBird um, that there's a lot of oyster catchers on the west side of the Courtney Campbell on the turnaround. Uh, on either side of the road there, and most of them are migratory. I guess a, a lot of them are banded. I haven't made it over there to see them this year, but in the past I have. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, that's a that's a good spot for um, at high tide where they'll they'll hang out and um, pass the tide. Well, thanks a lot. Any other questions, guys? Well, thank you, Jeff, so much for sharing with us today. It's really nice to see you always. And um, Happy New Year, everybody. Yep. Happy, nice happy New Year. Absolutely. My pleasure. Birdie, birdie New Year. <laughs> Birdfield. Yay. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Okay, so everybody for next month, keep your eye peeled. If we can, we will try to meet in public, but we are trying to be sensitive to the, the variants and the coronavirus pandemic you know, news and respond to that. But meanwhile, it's so nice to see your faces here and participating in our um, Zoom meetings. And so thank you for doing that. Thank you. Be well. Thank you guys. Thank, Bye -bye. You. Thank you. Take Bye -bye. care. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Jeff.